So before I forget, there's um, Sangay Kadro uh, is um, giving a talk tomorrow. She is a very uh, venerable uh, nun in our organization in the Foundation for Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition. And she's been teaching for 40 plus years. Uh, she was the author of um, How to Meditate and some other books as well. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's cultivating the heart of kindness and compassion. A talk and guided meditation, uh, 7.30 tomorrow evening, 7.30. Uh, on Zoom, same ID. Uh, yeah. It will be uh, posted again tonight or tomorrow, I'm sure. Okay. So let's uh, let's compose ourselves. with our mobiles on silent. And we're slowing down, stopping almost, and paying attention to this simple, deceptively simple, very dignified act of sitting still on the ground, sitting upright. without the need, at least temporarily, for chasing, chasing around, chasing our tail almost as it were. Simply sitting still. Seeing What's, what's going on in this body-mind phenomenon in the present moment. So here we are going against the flow, uh, against the current, normal current, of delving into the past and uh, anticipating the future. It's simply going to be with this body and our breath in the present moment. And together with that, also we're realizing our interconnectedness with others, how we depend on them and they on us. And how we are linked with everything on this planet. And of course, directly and indirectly linked with the solar system, depending 
critically depending on, on the sun for warmth and life. And at this point in time, when so many things seem to be, in a sense, falling apart, morally, politically, socially, uh, very crucially, uh, environmentally, at this time, there's great need to encourage ourselves in the path of love and compassion, and compassionate activity. On whatever scale we can manage. That initially might mean making friends with ourselves properly so that we can be of some real benefit to others. So a sense of gratitude also for other people who make all of this possible and for this continuing precious human life, which is easily lost, it is said. Difficult to find, easily lost. I'm making strong motivation for the session that I'm going to engage in this session together with others in order to strengthen my compassionate resolve, the open heart of bodhicitta as much as I can through meditation, discussing, listening, reflecting. Bringing the attention to the breath that's engaged in breath awareness practice, stillness, relaxation, diligence, making sure all those three qualities are present. And gently but firmly bringing the mind back to the breath whenever we recognize that it's been distracted in the thinking process.
a sense of letting go and relaxing, especially with the out breath. Feeling the tension, the muscles, the face, shoulders, neck. Dissolving with the outcome.
Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> Monday and Tuesday, we were continuing with chapter two of Shantideva's great text, the confession chapter. And he was uh, taking us through in a very graphic way uh, what it might be like if we were to die unprepared, not having acknowledged and purified our minds of all of the uh, unwholesomeness that we've accumulated in the past. Um, and so he asks, you know, how, how can I be freed from this fear? In verse 59, how can I relax and enjoy myself? He asks in verse 60, what, <coughs> excuse me, what remains with me now from the terminated experiences of the past? You know, what, what is left from those experiences? Yet through my great attachment to them, I've been going against my spiritual master's advice. So caught up in our eight worldly feelings, especially those connected with wanting pleasure, trying to avoid pain, seeking for comfort, seeking for distraction all the time. Um, this is what we've been indulging in in the past. That's what we're attached to. All of those past experiences that brought some satisfaction, some pleasure. They've all gone now, haven't they? And it's like eating food. We eat in the morning, then by midday or even earlier, we're hungry again. And again, we eat again and again and again. There's no final satisfaction. So due to our attachments, our aversions, we keep on creating our unwholesomeness, unwholesome actions, 10 unwholesome actions and their derivatives. So Shantideva was asking, you know, since I have to leave this life alone, no one's going with me. What's the use of this, you know, what's the use of making friends and enemies? It seems utterly pointless. In another image, I think there's, you know, this image of like cattle being uh, led to the slaughter or by people being led to the uh, guillotine or whatever. What's the point of generating attachments and uh, quarrels on the way, on the way to our deaths? So in verse 62, he makes a very definite statement. And this is something you know, which is the heart in many ways of the path, the basic path. How can I be sure, <coughs> excuse me, how can I be surely freed from unwholesomeness, the source of misery? Continuously, night and day, I should only consider this. So the real warrior, in Buddhism, person who uh, 
encounters and overcomes the disturbing emotions, the unwholesomeness. To uh, fight with and kill other beings is uh, pointless. It's, it's considered crazy, really. It's um, harming, killing beings who are going to die anyway. It's simply the source of pain, more pain. So one should just consider this, our unwholesomeness and how we could be free of that. I wonder what uh, Prima Children says about this. Hmm. It's extremely difficult, she says, to resist the seduction of habits, even when we know how unsatisfying the results will be, we persist in the same old patterns, which illogically hold out the promise of comfort. So we have to relate this to our own lives. This is not supposed to be theory. To rid ourselves of inevitable suffering, it's crucial to acknowledge on the spot how we repeatedly get hooked. Teachers refer to it in different ways, heartbreak with samsara, nausea, Nausea with samsara, nausea with the tendency to act on unwise impulses over and over again. Yeah. So we shouldn't make this getting hooked, we shouldn't allow it to make us just feel terrible and unworthy. We should uh, practice the, the four powers, the, the four opponent powers of compassion, which are the regret and the taking refuge, uh, compassion, the actual um, remedy itself, whatever practice we engage in to purify, and then the fourth power is the power of uh, resolving as much as possible not to engage in the action again. Being mindful, mindful of the suffering to come. That's verse 64. Mindful of the suffering to come. In, uh, the, in the um, bachelor, it's my mind terrified by the misery to come. So if we were to really be mindful of the sufferings of samsara, suffering of the lower realms, the causes that can throw us into those lower realms, we were really mindful of that, then that would be a strong motivation to resist these harmful urges. Um, yeah. So in the later chapters of this book, like especially chapters five and six, which are the chapters on, on guarding alertness, 
and patience and so forth, but also chapter four on uh, conscientiousness, then uh, we get detailed instructions on how to work with these harmful, disturbing emotions, these harmful urges. But first, like in this chapter, we have to acknowledge that it's there and that it's harmful. It's like if we've taken poison, we have to acknowledge we've taken poison, that it's harmful, that we need to do something about it. We can't just go on in the same old way thinking there's no problem. It doesn't matter. So in the presence of the Buddhas, the guides and protectors, Shantideva confesses it all. He doesn't hold anything back. That I humbly confess all of his uh, negative deeds. Having fully acknowledged past and present actions, he wholeheartedly aspires never again to be deceived by the false promises of addictions and um, habitual responses by, you see, she says, by cleaning the slate, uh, he creates the opportunity for his basic sanity to emerge. So this is another way of saying that, you know, we all have the Buddha nature, that's all very well, but how are we going to allow it to emerge? That basic sanity right now appears to be buried underneath the uh, mass of conflicting emotions and you know, powerful habits which inhibit the uh, that sprout of Buddha nature to uh, to really grow and flourish so um, yeah we have to we have to realize that there's work to be done there So the basis is that, how can I make sure to rid myself of evil, only cause of sorrow? This should be my one concern, my only thought both night and day. Then the uh, third chapter, is basically one of rejoicing, full acceptance of the awakening mind is how uh, Bachelor translates it, or commitment. So uh, here he finishes his presentation of the sevenfold offering with uh, rejoicing, requesting the teachers to teach the Dharma, requesting them to remain and dedicate the merit. So there's different ways of uh, talking about rejoicing. It's more traditional ways, there's more, you know, there's various ways we can look at it, but basically um, it's enhancing our own capacity to be delighted, to be joyful, to be positive, and to completely transcend the uh, miserable, ridiculous, uh, miserable mind of envy and jealousy, which is very easily arises. Um, when we see the good fortune or the happiness uh, of others. <clears throat> Excuse me a moment. Is, it, is the fan okay? Yeah. Not too small. <clears throat> So, 
envy, jealousy, they are very powerful factors, aren't they, in this world? I mean, look how miserable it makes people's lives, how much it makes people competitive. Um, it can also lead to verbal and physical violence if we are envious enough of others. Um, if we covet what they have and what we think we don't have enough of, it can be an incredibly uh, destructive emotion. So rejoicing completely acts as an antidote to that. It's, it uh, encourages us to connect with our own capacity to be empathetic and to develop love and compassion. Very often when we uh, sort of feeling not very good or somehow downhearted or feeling uh, you know, that we ourselves are not good enough, we can easily get um, fixated on the good qualities or the uh, success and so forth of other people and begin to resent it isn't it? We resent it. We feel, it may be unspoken, but we do feel somehow, why can't I be like that? Well, you know, they are, they're better than me. You know? It's almost a kind of self-loathing comes up. And that leads to the, 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 uh, the envy. So rejoicing is to wholeheartedly lift up one's heart as much as we can when we make a habit of being happy when others are happy, when others have what we don't have or have more of it than we have. And it, it's not easy in the beginning. It's not easy at all. But um, maybe it can be practiced. Maybe we could experiment. Shantideva is, of course, he here is um, rejoicing in the, in the awakening mind, in bodhicitta. Um, but we don't have to limit it to that, obviously. I mean, it's better to start with small things. And so if we have a, a friend who has some particular good quality or, uh, you know, engages in a particular wholesome action again and again, we can think of that and think, wow, that, that's, that's really good. How, how wonderful that is. You know? Because it's bringing happiness to others and bringing, you know, positive uh, sort of imprints for that person themselves. So how wonderful that is. Perhaps because many of us, or many people in this world, just don't have enough happiness and joy in their lives, it, uh, it becomes difficult for them sometimes to, to cope with the happiness or success of other people, or even the goodness of other people, because it makes them feel, oh, you know, I'm not good enough. So we have to, uh, I think generate that sense of confidence in our own potential, in our own goodness, and make a habit of being happy when we see the happiness of others, um, the good actions of others. Uh, for example, if there are people who have better circumstances, also better, you know, anything, better clothes, better body, better food, better houses, then one could make a habit of um, saying, well, oh, that's great, you know, that's wonderful. Because those things also don't come about without causes. If, if somebody has a very uh, attractive or um, you know, handsome or strong, very useful body, then according to the teachings, it didn't just come about totally by chance, you know? That person created the cause for that at some point, that there was a continuum of 
continuum in the past of that consciousness created the causes to have that. There's a whole uh, section in the Lam Rim teachings in the section on karma, on uh, the eight attributes of a good human rebirth. I can't remember them all, but we have been through it. For example, a strong body, handsome body, a body that doesn't get sick, you know, having the ability to help others, uh, so on and so forth. We need that kind of uh, human life, human body. It's not just enough to be reborn human, you know, to be reborn human and very sick and very uh, fragile and uh, easily, uh, you know, succumbing to disease and so forth. That kind of body is not so useful for oneself and not so useful for helping others. So if we see others who have a good, good circumstances, you know, good body, good facilities, we should rejoice because they have created the cause for it. We can't see it, or usually we can't see it, but um, they have. So we should be happy at that because the causes for that are positive causes. And if it enables others to uh, benefit other people, then we should you know, be doubly happy. We should be really happy. But it's not easy because our habit is to very much be trying to, you know, keep up, keep up with the Sharmas, keep up with the Jones, Joneses, um, being very competitive and easily, uh, being easily provoked by the greater, you know, good fortune or whatever we perceive of others. We make, that makes us feel uncomfortable, makes us feel um, somehow not good enough. You know? So rejoicing. So when we practice rejoicing in our um, sadhanas, in our practices, Lama Zoprimbache encourages to spend quite a lot of time with that practice and to first um, think of all the positive actions that we have engaged in, each one of us, that both has engaged in, uh, even small positive actions, and then to think how wonderful it is, how wonderful it is. So you might think, of course, that's a kind of self-congratulatory practice, but uh, not really, it doesn't have to be that way. It's, yeah, it's not as though one is um, feeding one's ego or, you know, pretending to be something on it and doesn't have to be very selfish and uh, egotistical at all. It's just one is happy because one has created a cause for happiness. One has created the cause to further liberate one's, one's Buddha nature. One could look at it that way. So rejoicing in one's own positive actions first. That would be the first thing. And then Rinpoche says to um, think of one's friends, uh, one's peer group, one's other Dharma friends and practitioners and see all the positive actions that they're engaging in. And then to say, wow, that's great. How wonderful that is. You know? How wonderful that is. So if one practices like this, if one engages in this on the basis of a calm and clear mind, and also with an understanding of karma a little bit, realizing that the, the goodness, the good actions, the good circumstances of others are based on positive causes, then it's perhaps makes a, a lot of good reasons to rejoice. So oneself, then one's friends, and then um, Rinpoche advises to think about people who um, are really practicing well. So those people who are really practicing, uh, for example, uh, moral conduct, 
concentration, wisdom, engaging in those uh, three higher trainings strongly. Uh, and again, thinking of the benefits of that, what it can lead to. And then again, thinking how wonderful it is, how wonderful it is. So rejoicing in that, being happy at that. Yeah. And then lastly, rejoicing in the activity of the Bodhisattva, which is what Shantideva is doing here. Basically, he's um, rejoicing in the thoughts and speech and the actions of very highly evolved beings actually here. He's saying in the first verse of chapter three, he's saying, gladly do I rejoice in the virtue that relieves the misery of all those in unfortunate states and that gives happiness to those who are suffering. Yeah. <clears throat> With joy, I celebrate the virtue that relieves all beings from the sorrows of the states of loss and places those who languish in the realms of bliss. Hmm. Okay. Well, Pema Children mentioned something based on her experience in um, helping people in prisons based on this verse. based on the uh, virtue, because here Shantideva is rejoicing in the virtue, the wholesomeness that relieves the misery of those who are suffering in the lower realms or in very unfortunate states. So, hmm. she said, I have a Buddhist friend who's an inmate at San Quentin prison in California. Uh, one day he was being harassed by a guard, but he did not retaliate. The other men saw this and asked him how he kept his cool. He told them that if he made the guard madder, uh, he might go home and beat his children. The guard might. This is the kind of virtuous and compassionate understanding Shantideva refers to in his opening stanza. And then he rejoices in the virtue that creates the cause for the awakening of the Arhat. In the definite freedom that embodied creatures can um, attain from the miseries of psychic existence. I mean, if we think about, again, it, I mean, so much of this depends on how much we have reflected on uh, suffering. So if we really have done that a little bit, then we can rejoice at causes that relieves the suffering of other people the mental and physical suffering. So we rejoice in all of that. We rejoice in the amazing gathering of virtue that creates the awakening of the Arhat. And then in the full Buddhahood, I rejoice in the awakening of the Buddhas and in the spiritual levels of the bodhisattvas, their children. I mean, it's really something amazing. How marvelous that they attain liberation for the benefit of themselves and others. So the refrain that um, Lama Zobrimbache suggests 
is, you know, to think how wonderful it is, how wonderful it is. But of course, we should use whatever words inspire us. Whatever words inspire us, we should use to um, when we do this practice of rejoicing. I remember once some of us um, had a great privilege of spending, seemed like almost a week at, uh, at Travasti uh, when it wasn't so crowded, wasn't so built up. This is the place where um, <laughs> the Buddha uh, spent quite a few rainy season retreats. I uh, can't remember the exact number it's supposed to be, but it's over 20, I think. It's a beautiful place. Hello, more than 20. 27, maybe. So we were there with Lama Zopra and Bache, and there were about eight or 10 of us. And somehow uh, time seemed to stop there. Somehow the outer world didn't seem to exist. And there were just that group of us there at Travasti. And Rinpoche was giving teachings. I remember one day we sat in, I think, uh, the Burmese Vihar there, very simple place. And um, Rinpoche led a meditation on, uh, on rejoicing. Rejoicing actually at the um, different attributes uh, of the precious human rebirth. There we were not rejoicing so much in um, other people's wholesomeness or virtue, but we were just rejoicing in, um, in all of the kind of freedoms and the endowments we have with this precious human life. And at the end of every, <laughs> every one, we stopped and he, you know, he said, now think you know, how wonderful it is, how wonderful it is. And of course, being there in that place, holy place, uh, with Rinpoche, uh, was very, very powerful. Of course, <laughs> da daily life takes over very quickly. And uh, that kind of inspiration uh, does not last long. But were one to practice regularly, uh, I'm sure that kind of inspiration would stay. But um, this is a practice that can be done easily, the rejoicing practice and the reflecting on how wonderful it is. Okay, we take a one or two minute break and then we'll have some discussion. जो पढ़ा आप बोल रहे थे कि मन है 
शांति देवा कह रहे हैं हाँ शांति देवा कह रहे हैं तो ये जो निगम बोध है आप देखे होंगे निगम बोध बहुत पहले तो वहाँ पे गेट्स भरे हुए हैं यू नो गीता श्लोक आ सकते हैं तो द लास्ट गेट पे लिखा है यहाँ तक आने के लिए धन्यवाद यहाँ तक आने के लिए धन्यवाद अच्छा यहाँ से मैं अकेला ही जाऊंगा <laughs> यहाँ से लास्ट गेट निगम बोध अजीर जी इज इज क्वोटिंग व्हाट इज रिटन एट निगम बोध द्रिमेशन प्लेस ऑन द बैंक्स ऑफ द यमुना इन दिल्ली या या दैट्स गुड इज इट I also find this that sort of body comforting. It makes what it makes the events comforting. Yeah, uh, it makes it uh, seem a little more commonplace. Yeah. What's happened to you all life for the things that those those in the past yeah, yeah. that's only others. I'm sorry, people online may not be able to hear the discussion, but um, people are 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 relating their experiences when they. Have been to these uh, cremation uh, grounds, cremation sites. For uh, Pradeep Ji, it was a sense of fear, but also the absurdity of of it all, um, and the absurdity because of the but fact that we are just so chasing I around. Mean, suddenly, realize that so many people are. So many people are. Dying are dying every day so not to take one's uh, personal loss so seriously and also you know, do you mean one the fact that oneself is also going to die yeah, not to take that too seriously so one is holding on to something he says that Uh, is going to end, finish, and then Rahul Ji mentioned uh, that it's in one way reassuring, even it's comforting. Comforting to find that uh, this very great event in one's life is also fairly commonplace. <laughs> <Okay, laughs> <that's laughs> he said that this um, this. this event in life you know this very big event in life death is, seems is fairly commonplace you know? yeah hmm is that what you felt when you go to have you been I've, to the cremation of I've anyone the, very close to you i went to well i have hmm. uh, i mean i went to the father's cremation when i was 16 but uh, Recently, I went to Nigam Bhut for uh, aunt's husband's death. He was very old; he was still in his nineties. And just that sort of the crowd that Deep Ji spoke about, uh, and you know, just all these bustling coming in, you know, just fires going up. There's a lot of bustling that goes around. You know, a lot of sort of shouting and all of that. You know, mm. it's like almost like a death bazaar mm. in a sense. Because you. Know, you. Yeah, yeah, it's but, like people uh, queuing up at these places. There's a lot of hustle and bustle and noise. It's like a bazaar. No, so there's also an unsavory sort of commercial uh, and you know spiritually exploitative aspect to it. Yeah, there's but a. Along with that, there is also a sense of I think an unspoken sense of solidarity among mourners and grievers of many kinds. So there's a sense of solidarity sense, he says, amongst uh, mourners, yeah. amongst those grieving. It it sort of uh, just the scale of it puts you in a more sympathetic perspective. That's what the uh, the scale of the, it does what the scale of 
the just the number of people and number of viewers to a small screen loss in, in some kind yeah. of perspective. So the scale of what's happening there, the scale of you know loss for so many people uh, puts one's own situation, one's own loss in in perspective. Yeah. Yes. These are some of the responses here. Um, I don't know if anybody online wants to mention anything. And I can uh, make sure people here can hear it and repeat it if necessary. Mm. <clears throat> I think uh, the cremation, which really affects, I really found it is in Banaras. So many bodies burning, and so many people are waiting but in the Ganges in the water because they bring the bodies from different places because they find it very virtuous. I counted once 21 of them. Yeah. But the mystery is that by the side of that, there's a four story building and there was a marriage going on there. <laughs> and the song was Shira Ki Jawani. <laughs> you know, it's a full, full drum. Kiski so Jawani? Shira Ki Jawani. It's a song, film song. There's a filmy song which was a hit one time. Shira Ki Jawani. Shira Ki Jawani. Uh -huh. Just the name. Okay, so Ajirji is uh, mentioning. Uh, so it's a, it's a, in that, one way, you know, the life yeah. and the death in its full. That he saw 21 cremations happening at Banaras, uh, the banks of the Ganga. And next door, there was a four story building where a marriage was happening. And uh, a famous film song was blaring out Sheila Ki Javani. <laughs> so. Life and death together, yeah. That's how it is, isn't it? Yeah. In fact, in fact that's what is really happening if one really scales it up. Sure. Isn't it? Come on. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I used to think, what, what will I do? How will I survive? How will I live uh, when my father is gone? But it just, you know, it happens and then you, <laughs> things carry on, you know. How old did you say you were when your father passed? 16. 16. It's very young. So what, any... Comments, folks, online, online people, rectangular people. In fact, uh, rectangular people here. They're the best example of the illusion. Yet it is functioning. Where? Illusion. Illusion like. Yeah. Illusion like, yeah. yeah. So, the best example I say is uh, the so, people online. Yes. They are there, they are functioning. They're functioning. They are illusion like. Now, JC says all you folks online are functioning, <laughs> are functioning, but you are uh, illusion like. You are functioning. There You're just about a, functioning, yeah. Best I guess example, you, yes, of like an illusion. We best are. example, huh? Elaine agrees with you. Best yeah, example. Very good, Elaine. Happy to hear that. <laughs> Anushri has a comment. And as usual, it's more than a few sentences, but it's uh, uh, the Bardo teachings show us precisely what will happen if we prepare for death and what will happen if we don't. Well, what does this mean? Oh. I thought we already did that, Anushree, in the last chapter. This is from the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. The same para states, if we refuse to accept death now, while we are still alive, we will pay dearly throughout our lives at the moment of death and thereafter. 
the effects of this refusal will ravage this life and all the lives to come. Yes, indeed. Indeed. That is a very good book. Very good book to read. So beautifully written. Yeah. It's like, um, <laughs> you know, on a mundane level, stitch in time saves nine. You know, you get holes in your clothes and you don't do anything about it before you know it. Your whole shirt is torn and unusable and then it's too late. So um, if we just spend life ignoring certain realities and trying to hold on, I guess, trying to hold on to things, which is a kind of refusing death, refusing change, wanting to hold on, then yeah, it makes sense that death is gonna be difficult, right? Which is why some teachers put it this way, that living is dying. And Bob Dylan says, those not busy being born are busy dying. Different ways of looking at it. Yeah. Yes. Um, Nivita is referring to basically a tantric meditation where you meditate on the white and the red drops and things like that. That's very esoteric. Um, it is mentioned in some basic texts, isn't it? Is it there in the Alamrim meditation guide from Kopan? It, it, it could be. Anyway, um, this is when one actually engages in a meditation where one uh, pretends that one is dying and one goes through the, uh, the eight, I think the eight stages of death you know, the, the absorptions that are beginning to happen when one dies and what is happening on the internal level, the visions you have uh, apparently when um, the absorptions occur. Uh, so that is, yeah, that, 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 that's a little bit esoteric um, and has to be done in a very simple way. One wouldn't do that sort of meditation without proper guidance. But it is useful because it, um, for example, in that meditation, it tells you what happens at the different stages. You know, the eyesight becomes weak and then you can't smell anything. You can't taste anything. You can't move the body at all. You can't discern things. You can't, uh, you know, you can no longer really categorize anything. One is becoming more and more you know, internal, all the energies which have supported life and the different organs, the different faculties, they are absorbing. And the mind is becoming more and more subtle and the body is uh, basically packing up. So that can be done and it could be very, very powerful doing that meditation. But the other esoteric signs that you mentioned with the drops, that's not necessary to do, and that's basically uh, that's basically uh, uh, in a you know, Vajrayana practice, which um, is can be useful to know about, but uh, yeah, maybe better to do with uh, seriously with you know, a proper guide, proper teacher who knows that practice very well. You saw it. Just, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, like, what, what is like, like meditation would be? Well, well, the basic one, as you know, is uh, death is definite, time of death indefinite. Only Dharma practice helps at the time of death. That can be done. That's a ninefold uh, practice with these three major headings. So death is definite, then you think about how 
you know, lifespan can't be increased. Everyone who's ever been born has died, so forth. Then you think of how time of death is indefinite, that, um, you know, young people can die before old people. Those things that are supposed to help you live longer can actually be a cause for death. And then thinking about all the different circumstances that can occur, you know, that can um, cause death at any time. And then reflecting on uh, the third point that only, uh, basically the third point is that uh, only a tamed mind, only a wholesome mind can help at the time of death. In other words, only dharma can really help you at the time of death. And then you think about how friends and relations can't really help you because, you know, often they're just creating a big drama and very unhappy or whatever, or already, you know, discussing how they're gonna, <laughs> whatever, you know, <laughs> use, uh, go against your will. And, uh, you know, so what's gonna help? So that's one basic way. Then this other way is to go through the absorptions that you, uh, and then the inner signs, you have the mirage, then you have the sign of uh, smoke or sparks and a flame dying out. Then you have uh, you know, white and red and black kind of visions. There's that way of also going through it, which is more subtle, but they're both, those can give us the sense of it's going to happen. This is, it makes it more immediate. It's like uh, you hear, you hear about a place. Maybe you hear about, I don't know, you hear about Melbourne. It's just a, a word really. But then you look at the literature, you look at brochures, you look at a travel guide, then you get more of a sense that, yeah, really there is a Melbourne and this is what it's like. And then one day you go there. So this is just introducing us to the fact, the fact of death, preparing us for it. So that when it happens, uh, you know, we know where we are and, and the real practitioners can then utilize that process very beautifully. And, um, use the subtlety of mind that naturally occurs after the absorptions, the mind becomes very subtle. So if they've already utilized that subtle mind in their meditation during life, due, the, due to their inner you know, deep tantric yogas, then they can utilize it more powerfully even at the time of death. So uh, for tantric practitioners, very important to uh, meditate on all the stages of death be able to utilize it and for the mind to become more and more blissful and subtle as that process um, evolves. Yeah. So for practitioners, it's a wonderful opportunity and for ordinary people, it's very difficult. Isar, sorry, Is, yeah. Isar bhai. Um. Yeah. Kabirji, just going back to today's session, um, the book that you have by Pema Chaudhryan, is that yeah. just the text or is it a commentary as well? It's a commentary. It's okay. called Becoming, Becoming Bodhisattvas. This one. So is it on, like, it's on a, a guide to the Bodhisattva's way, way of life or is it different? It's, it's a commentary on a guide to the Bodhisattva's way of life. But okay. not commenting on chapter nine on the wisdom chapter, because that's oh. too difficult. That would be a whole other book and so forth. But okay. everything else, yeah. Okay, thank you. And the other thing, the place that you mentioned where you were with Rinpoche, where is that again? Shravasti is about uh, four or five hours from Lucknow, not far from the uh, to Nepali border, uh, okay. near a town called Balrampur. If, if you go northwest, Northeast, rather, from Lucknow, you come to a place called Bharaich, 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 I don't know mm -hmm. how it's pronounced. And then you go uh, east from there, uh, and it's there. Okay. Easy to find, uh, uh, Shavasti. 
should I say? And it's I, in UP itself. It's, it's in Uttar Pradesh, yeah, near yeah. Balrampur. You'll easily find it on uh, Google, Google Maps. Very wonderful place, although it's a bit different from how it was when we went. But still, I'm sure very, very inspiring and not as crowded as um, Bodh Gaya and uh, other places. Thank you. Although there's some very big monastery, there's a very huge nunnery has come up apparently nearby. But I think, um, yeah, that's a little bit away from the holy site. And I'm not sure how many pilgrims go there, but it would be much more than when we were there, I think. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Rosa. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, not be able to live our lives fully. We will learn many aspects. Yeah, think about that, Anushri. What do you think is the aspect of yourself that has to die? What is it in us that has to die for us to become free, do you think? Reflect on that. Nitya, so these meditations on death are to overcome a fear of death, yes. And what is the subtlety of the mind that tantric practitioners are cultivating? Uh, I can only answer you in very general terms because also these are supposed to be esoteric and slightly hidden practices. But what it's saying is actually, um, in simple terms, thank you, thank you, is that uh, we have a gross level of mind that we're kind of using now. It can become a little bit more subtle when we pretend or try to meditate or do meditate and the mind becomes more subtle. And it could become uh, quite subtle during meditation if we go quite deeply. But then there's the very subtle level of awareness, the most subtle, you could say, uh, which is the clear light mind. And it's given different names, but let's call it clear light mind here. So tantric practitioners through their uh, meditations, they, they awaken this uh, very subtle mind uh, during meditation. Uh, this very subtle mind, obviously it also comes up very strongly at the time of death because all of the gross minds are dissolving, you see. That's why death is such an opportunity for these practitioners. The grosser levels of consciousness are naturally falling away, uh, revealing the naked, uh, you could say, uh, very pure, uh, pristine awareness, the clear light mind. So if, we, if that practitioner has been uh, utilizing, uh, activating, utilizing the clear light mind while they're alive in their meditations, then they can utilize it at the time of death. So it's, it's uh, the most subtle level of mind that uh, occurs when apparently you bring the, uh, the, uh, the energies or the wind, the prana, the prana and all of the uncontrolled wind that courses through our body right now when it's brought into the central pathway, the central channel, channel the shushumna, then the mind becomes very, very subtle and very blissful. So Tantra is uh, basically uh, trying to generate a very blissful and subtle level of awareness, consciousness, with which to meditate on reality, with which to meditate on emptiness and so forth. It's much more powerful you see, than an ordinary gross level of mind. It's, um, it's the difference between a, you know, not, not very sharp knife and a laser, something like that. You know? This very subtle mind is um, extremely powerful. Yeah. And there are many methods in the tantric yogas for utilized for awakening that very subtle mind. But for more, you should read authentic literature and get teachings from uh, fully qualified tantric uh, masters.
and to get the deeper teachings anyway you will not receive them until you have received initiation from those uh, teachers yeah elaine uh kabir ji <clears throat> nitya was saying that uh, you know is it to get over the fear of death there was a quote by rilke that i read today that i would like to share it says death is our friend precisely because it brings us into absolute and passionate presence with all that is here that is natural death is our friend because it brings us into absolute and passionate presence with all that is here absolute and passionate presence with all that is here with all that is here yes that is natural that is love that's the whole quote huh that is natural that is natural that is love that is love yes but there was another lovely little uh, children's book that i saw today duck the duck death and the tulip and it's it's a children's book and the and the duck on the first page turns around and sees death behind him and he gets a fright and uh, the duck asks where where did you come from and death says i've been here all along with you mm. so he kind of um, explains that every day we change a little bit so we are dying in certain ways lots of cells are dying and lots of hair is dying and all kinds of things keep changing which is a kind of death so it's always there there's no need to be really terrified of it so that's a good way of kind of making friends slowly yeah did you hear that did you hear that yeah i mean but we are terrified of death in life we're terrified of change we're terrified of people leaving us or losing something which is a kind of death um some people can't sleep you know can't get to sleep and I, and i feel that's a kind of um fear of letting go fear of because of the stress because of tension because of holding modern people have so many problems with uh, with sleep you know someone i know very well said that last night uh, you know they didn't sleep at all whereas they have every reason to be very tired so you know it, it's like we find it difficult to to let go don't we which is death Hmm. similar story in man search for meaning yeah and if you read with any of you old enough to have read the castaneda books in the 70s then castaneda says that the uh, don juan the sorcerer used to tell him that uh, death is always there i think uh, he used to say uh, just behind your left shoulder something like that death is there all the time that away yeah that was their way of putting it death is always there so whether we take that as um death within life or the final death of this body and of course death is never final is it in this way of looking at things we're just changing guest houses we uh the karma to be in a particular guest house finishes and then we go somewhere else and some guest houses are nicer than others yeah all very sobering right again elaine yeah you're very talkative today i very know good. suddenly look a bit yeah. i just remembered a great uh, i was reading somewhere written by a great tibetan master who said uh, 
why we should practice about becoming familiar with death you know what is the purpose of uh, trying to make friends with it and practice every day and right. he said that when you die you will be so terrified you will yeah. be like a dog that's been hit on the head in the middle of a crossroads and you won't know where to run so practice before so at that time your state of mind is calm composed and you can actually think of your next birth which is so important so to remain calm we need to practice beforehand otherwise we'll be so terrified when we die right right it's 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 even terrifying to think that one might be terrified at that time yeah and we humans we uh we try to soften it by by you know thinking that oh uh when i die i'll just be reuniting with my you know whatever mother father friends relations kind of re reuniting with them on the other side those who've already died so we have all kinds of ways of uh, trying to make it uh, seem okay. Um, but Buddhism wouldn't necessarily agree with that, would it? Recently, someone died in our family and I, you know, the, the son just felt that his mother was now, you know, reunited with, uh, with her husband, her late husband. <coughs> who died many years ago and whom she missed, you know, so much all the rest of her life. So now she's just reunited with him. But uh, yeah, don't know about that. <laughs> Everyone's going to their heavenly abode, right? Whereas Buddhism has said, says that most people aren't going to their heavenly abode. You know, there's six realms, and depending on many factors, many of us are not going to have, you know, heavenly realms. Two participants raised hands. Okay, Nitya. Can't hear you for some reason. Although you are shown as uh, unmuted. Did this happen last time? Can you hear? Can you hear me? Is yeah. Can, yeah. can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. can't hear you, Nitya. Can, can you hear me, Kariyaji? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I think it was my headphones. Right. Is it my turn to speak? I, I missed that when I was taking out my, my earphones. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say a word of appreciation for the teaching on um, rejoice, rejoicing, actually, because uh, for me, for my rather um, uh, basic understanding of, of uh, the teachings, uh, often most the... the the most central message that's emphasized is on emptiness and and not too much on you know rejoicing in the fullness of life and um, and that was that was really nice uh, to sort of dwell on for for me for my mind to dwell on to, to think about that's all. It was also the topic of the morning meditation. Were yeah, you there I know. This morning. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I had half my mind on the morning meditation because half my mind was on His Holiness the Dalai Lama was also teaching. But I had, the, uh, I had my mobile on the Tushita meditation just to check what's going on. It sounded very nice. Yeah, yeah it's important to rejoice. It's important to engage in these very, very, yeah, sort of empowering practices because emptiness is um, also empowering, of course, but uh, Emptiness can get a little, you know, uh, heady and uh, difficult. And um, yeah, it's not necessarily a topic that is to be taught first, you know, 
definitely. So rejoicing, basic uh, loving kindness, uh, these practices are very important, obviously. And they're also important because we're social beings, you know. Uh, we are going around looking and talking and interacting with people. It's, it's best if we uh, are somehow <laughs> uplifted and kind and sort of, uh, yeah, happy. Uh, more on the rejoicing side than the grumpy, envious sort of other side, right? Uh, it's just basic uh, as human beings better to be you know, positive and happy and smiling occasionally. But it also trains your eyes to look for beauty around, which is, uh, I think, what spoke to me. Trains the mind to look for beauty. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that is, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder about beauty in big cities, but there may be different definitions also of beauty. It doesn't have to be beautiful trees and parks. There could be many things. Um, but yeah, there, there is a lot of, I think, ugliness in what uh, we humans have created. Uh, but yeah, beauty. What else? I'm not eating tonight, so I don't have to I have to get up early and go somewhere. Kabirji. Haji. Um, so uh, the, the Rilke quote that uh, Elaine, uh, Elaine uh, Which mentioned. Quote? Which quote? The, the Rilke quote that oh, Elaine it, mentioned. It was yeah. Rilke, was it? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, um, I'd actually like to um, quote the first uh, couple of sentences of that particular letter as well. Yes, if you read it in your best style. <laughs> every, every <laughs> clear, not in a hurry it's, like it's... most people. Read it uh, in your best theatrical style, yeah. <laughs> so... Um... He begins the letter by saying, "Could you introduce our, this? He's, he, he, who's he writing to?" Um, he, he's writing to a friend, uh, uh, a countess. I don't remember the name. Oh, to a countess. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is circa 1920-25. Um, so he says, "Our effort, I suggest, can be dedicated uh, can be dedicated to this." to assume the unity of life and death and let it be progressively demonstrated to us. So long as we stand in opposition to death, we will disfigure it. Believe me, my dear Countess, death is our friend, our closest friend, perhaps the only friend who can never be misled by our ploys and vacillations. Ploys and I'm, machinations. No, vacillations. Vacillations. Yeah. V-A-C-I-W-L, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, Rilke is something else, isn't he? He's amazing. Thank you, Suji. Yeah. His letters to a young poet are also amazing, yeah? To the, so those are some of my favorite. Yes, yes, they That's are. Really, yeah. Marvelous. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I wish uh, we should really teach these things more, isn't it? I'm sure most students, many students of literature wouldn't have heard. I don't know what they teach in literature nowadays. They don't teach much literature. You don't see literature advertised in the education pages of uh, newspapers. It's all I medical, yeah, not much, uh, you don't see art, you don't see literature very much at all. This seems disheartening and uh, 
dangerous, I would say, but I'm quite biased. Yeah. Shall anything else? Otherwise, we will end. I, I just wanted to give um, a thought on the question raised by Elaine. Okay, Ajivji is responding to a thought raised by Elaine. Uh, I'm just putting from the Buddhist psychology and the philosophy perspective. Yeah. The death, death exists, but the death doesn't exist ultimately. So death exists, but death doesn't exist ultimately. Yeah. So he's thrown in a googly at the end. Would you like to explain what you mean by not ultimately? So I think uh, not inherent, inherently you can also put it. It's just a process. It's a process, yes. And we are holding that very strongly that yes, there is substantial death. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So would that would that uh, Ajitji, would that be true of life as well? Is that true of life yeah, as yeah, well? So is asking. Definitely. Definitely, he says. All yes. phenomena, rising, abiding, disintegration, they're all impermanent. Abiding, uh, sorry, arising, abiding, disintegrating, all phenomena are impermanent. Yeah. Ajirji is saying. Ajirji, thank you for that reminder. Thank you, Elaine is saying. Yeah. Just think that uh, death is a phenomenon. It has a conventional aspect and it has an ultimate aspect. Yeah, death has a conventional aspect and an ultimate aspect. Hmm. Yeah. And it's terrifying for those of us who can't let go. <laughs> Whether that means can't get, you know, let go of the uh, early morning cup of tea totally can't let go of it, or even a second cup. It doesn't have to be let going of very big things, but there are lots of small things that we can't let go of. That's part of that grasping. Yeah. Can't, can't let go of Netflix, can't let go of whatever. You know? Okay, good, let's dedicate that uh, session together. Uh, brings great benefit uh, to our own minds and uh, enables us to be of uh, more benefit for others. There's a whole, uh, there's a vast, uh, mm, there's a great need for people who are dying uh, to be cared for and to be guided and to be encouraged. And so that can happen if more of us understand death and come to terms with it. And, so forth. So the death and dying is a very important topic. So may we uh, utilize the reality of uh, conventional and ultimate death to wake ourselves up a little bit more and not, uh, not waste this precious life. May we never be separated from authentic teachings and teachers, and may all the authentic uh, great teachers have long and healthy lives. Uh, may all their wishes be fulfilled. May we be healthy and happy, have long lives, and be able to uh, complete our Dharma practice, uh, create the causes for at least a good uh, human rebirth with uh, access to the Dharma. And right now, may our lives be meaningful for others. Most meaningful. Okay, thank you very much. Um, ah, yeah, I mentioned tomorrow.
Yeah, seven thirty tomorrow. Yeah, okay. uh, reminder of uh, Venerable Sangay Kadro tomorrow seven thirty on the same channel. Oh. And, uh, what's the topic? Um, Cultivating a heart of uh, kindness and compassion. Yeah. So tomorrow, Sanjay Kadro, very, uh, very, uh, yeah, very wonderful. Thank you, uh, Kabirji. Thank America. you, Kabirji. Uh, thank you, thank you, Lane, for all your comments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Vishad, Saurabh, Isar, Nitya, everybody, Sudhirji, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.